This show is listener supported. You can join us and help our show grow to support more adoptees by going to adoptezon.com slash partner. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. I'm your host, Haley Radke, and this is a special episode in our healing series where I interview therapists who are also adoptees themselves, so they know from personal experience what it feels like to be an adoptee. Last week, we addressed cross-cultural intergenerational trauma, and we are continuing that theme today with Marta Sierra Drakenberg. She is back, and oh my goodness, this is so good. I can't wait to get to it. I just want to mention before we get started, though, that we do mention sexual assault, so please keep that in mind when you're deciding whether or not now is the best time for you to listen. And if you do have little ones around, please do put your earbuds in uh, because this is an adult conversation. (laughs) Okay, let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome back to Adoptees On, Marta Sierra Drakenberg. Hi, Marta. Hi, Haley. I can't wait to talk to you again today. I'm so excited. And I just, I forgot to do this last time, but I, you are a therapist, but you specialize in internal family systems. And can you just give us a quick snippet of what that means, because it's a little different from um, some of the therapists that we've had on the show before. And I think it's so valuable. It's such a valuable way, especially of looking at adoptee things. So please tell us a little bit about what IFS is before we get into what we're going to talk about today. So uh, IFS is an experiential therapy, which means that it's it's an experience. It's not just talking. And it's a way to access all the different parts of yourself meaning that we all are really multiple. We have lots of different parts of ourselves that feel lots of different ways and have lots of different beliefs and lots of different reactions to things. And and then when you add trauma in the mix that have been affected in different ways and then parts that are protecting the parts of us that have been traumatized and uh, it's just a whole world in there. And the goal of IFS therapy is to get yourself your authentic self or your heart, however you want to think about that, in a really solid relationship with all of your parts so that you can facilitate healing and feel more connected and less dysregulated and ideally move through triggers in a different way. And um, experiential therapy can also help build new neural pathways in the brain, which is really what's so hard about healing preverbal trauma in the first place. When you were first on the podcast and you taught us about it, it was so, so interesting. So if any of what Marta just talked about is interesting to you, go back and listen to her episodes 69 and 71. And she really gives us a deep dive into IFS there. Thank you. Okay. So we left off and we were talking about how different (laughs) reunion can be um, when it's international and really cross-culturally. We we talked about a lot of different things last time. And I want to continue that conversation. Um, You mentioned that, uh, you know, just even the nation of Colombia has trauma that has been kind of going on for generations and that there's not really access you know, in a regular, uh, what am I just trying to say? There's not really access to mental health care as kind of a regular practice and that shows. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that in your reunion and especially with your mother? So, yeah, the, the first thing I'll say is that I, I had talked in the last episode about kind of a second language barrier being a cultural language barrier. Uh, and I had said there was three. So the third one that we're going to talk more about today is this mental health language as its own language. So even as my language skills got stronger, I really found myself without the words for all of this mental health speak, right? Like this therapist talk that I use so casually in English, I was really struggling to even what words should I use? And and then more importantly than that, like, does that still even make sense? Does it register? Do you know what I mean? Like you had said boundaries in our last episode and I didn't stop you because I knew I wanted to talk about it today, <laughs> but that's a 
that's nothing. That means nothing. That may as well be Chinese, right? Like no one knows what a healthy boundary is. No one's ever experienced a healthy boundary. It's like this totally foreign concept that I'm introducing. So um, that's really hard. I like, you know, have worked my whole life, not only on teaching other people how to implement healthy boundaries, but uh, trying to, you know, walk the walk, like implement what I'm, what I'm asking my clients to implement. And I found myself really without the ability to do that because it's just not even understood. I couldn't even explain it if I wanted to. That's kind of blowing my mind. I'm just like, my mouth is like wide open. Cause I'm like, wow, that's not even translatable. So what do you do then? How do you explain a choice that you would be might might define as like, okay, I've got a boundary with this specific thing. How do you explain that choice then <laughs> if they're they don't understand that? You know, I think sometimes you just don't. Similar to in English, if someone's not not respecting your boundary, you don't keep explaining to them, right? You just say, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna do that. So a lot of times it would end up kind of just being like that. I'm not going to do that. And, and not even bothering really to go into the why there's already so much miscommunication that can happen in these relationships. And certainly, um, there was a lot of assumptions about why I was doing what I was doing all the time, which of course I was making too. We're all just trying to figure each other out. Uh, I just learned that they're going to make their assumptions about my behavior anyways, whether or not I try to explain it. So ultimately in those high moments of stress, I'm going to just have to do what's best for me. And I'm going to have to release control over what everybody thinks about that. That's so great. You sound like you have it together. (laughs) I'm like, Oh, how do I do that? (laughs) And so the other thing is just that, you know, we need each other. I know we talk about this all the time in your podcast. We talk about community all the time, but I just, I can't emphasize that enough uh, that that what got me through the hardest parts of that year was the people in my life that have gone before me. I have an amazing friend from Oregon who is older than me, has been in reunion longer, is from Colombia and knows the culture. And I would have, I had maybe four video calls with her over the course of a year, but they were so essential. And, and she's a clinician. She's not a therapist, but she's been working in adoption for years and years and years. So she speaks that language with me as well. And we would get into these really interesting discussions about, is it even ethical to hold our Colombian families to American mental health standards when they haven't had access to the education that we've had when they haven't had access to the resources that we have. Can I even say, you know, you're not respecting my boundaries. You're it's disrespectful and hurtful to me. I'm out. Is that really ethical? And I don't have a concrete answer. All I can say is that having those discussions with her definitely allowed me a lot more compassion. I do still ultimately do what I need to do for me, including the painful decision I made about my relationship with my brother. But it does help me in moments remember that there's just so much history in my family and in my country that I'm never going to ever understand. And I have to remember that, that I don't have all the puzzle pieces, that there's so much going on that I can't see. And I need to honor that the same way I want it honored for me, when I do something that's not understood, I don't want it to, the assumption to be negative or for someone to assume they understand completely why I'm doing that. You know, I want them to be curious. So if I'm, if I'm wanting curiosity on their end, then I have to be willing to also be curious. Well, that's a huge question. That is really intriguing. And I'm not going to go too far off track here, but uh, just a rabbit trail from that um, statement, the ethics of holding my Colombian family to the same standards as Americans because they don't have you know, access to mental health supports or even the same therapy language in quotation marks. Um, and I'm thinking about so many of our reunions have broken down and we, you know, we talk about, oh, well, you have to work on your own stuff first and 
lots of adoptees mm-hmm. and lots of first parents both haven't had any sort of therapy to deal with those things. And so I'm just, hmm, this is an interesting right. question to ponder. Hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. And, and given that I wouldn't, I'm so glad, you know, for all the work that I've done, it still was a really difficult situation. A lot of the time it was still hard to navigate things, but I was so grateful for all of the work I had already done and, and having the language of IFS, especially in really difficult situations saved me. So I guess that's an easy place to jump into what happened with my mom. So I'm really, really close with my mom. I I always have been, I feel really, really lucky. We're very connected. I think we always have been, uh, even before I knew about her, even before I found her, we're very similar in a lot of ways. We have a couple really different parts of our personality. One of the big ones is that she's very religious. Uh, Again, it's a really Catholic country. I sort of felt like really scared in the beginning. I remember telling her that I wasn't religious. I remember shaking and being nervous. You know, we were just texting over WhatsApp, but I didn't know how she was going to take it. Overall, she's pretty good with it, but it comes up in these ways because my mom's concept around her personal trauma is that she didn't have any trauma and anything that happened to her, she's given up to God. And so that's her defense mechanism around it, right? She's like wrapped this thing around it and she won't touch it. She's very receptive to me talking about my trauma and how our separation and and lots of things have affected me. She's fine with that, but there's just this block around what she's experienced. And I'm not just talking about the trauma of of my birth, which I'm a product of rape. So there was a lot of trauma around me coming into the world, but uh, she's experienced just so much more than that. I'm not going to list it. It's, I try to walk that line of telling my story Mm -hmm. versus telling her story. I'm, I feel fine disclosing the rape because it's my origin story, but you know, she's experienced a lot of other trauma in her life and this is how she survives it. And it's also how she's so loving and full of light anyways, despite it. And so it's allowed us to be close and build this relationship. That's very close. Um, but I suppose at some point that was going to boil over. So that happened in April on this big trip that I talked about in the last episode. So it was a lot that I already talked about two huge things. And so this is the last one, which is, uh, so we had been staying in my aunt's house. I met a bunch of new family while we're there. So as far as stressors on my mom's system, she's back where she grew up. She's back where she raised my brothers and sister. She's uh, staying in the house of an ex-boyfriend who was to her and was still kind of being but that's where some of my family was staying. She's introducing me to a bunch of new family, which I can't imagine how vulnerable that was for her. Uh, and I think more than she articulated out loud. Like she really wanted that to go a certain way, of course. Right. So obvious now, but I, I wasn't thinking about it then. Of course I was in my own overwhelm of I'm going to where my brothers and sister grew up. I'm going to meet all these new family. Right. I was in my story while she was in her story. And my relationship with my sister has always been very tense. She has a lot of stuff around me. I don't even want to talk about it, honestly, but we have a very difficult relationship and that was sort of moving towards a boiling point as well. And so because they were staying in a separate house together, they would often show up together and leave together. And so my mom wasn't actually seeing how I was interacting with my new family because when she would come around, my sister was with her and I would go away or I would shut down or I would go hang out with the kids or there was a lot of animals there too. I would go like play with the animals because I was trying not to flip out. <laughs> so I was taking, right. This is like an example, right? I was doing my mental health self-care, taking space, using my skills, using connection, all of these things that, I think are taking care of myself that are viewed externally, culturally as me being disconnected and antisocial. I'm over here like I'm doing such a great (laughs) job, right? And the the perception of me is that I'm like being disconnected and weird because the the assumption is like I'll spend every second with everyone all in the big group. And, you know, even just surface level, like every 10 people speaking Spanish at once for like three hours. I can only take it for so long before I have to go lay down. Like it's just 
too much uh, for me. I need a break. And so that was like one light element that was going on. But it's like tensions building throughout the week. Everyone's like talking about everything we're doing and everything that's happening. It's just like, that's very Latin family, like phone tree. Like I say something and then I get a text from like this cousin, like way over there. that like already heard about it because it goes like down like the line of whatever. It's nuts. Everyone tells everyone everything. Like there's a lot of <laughs> that stuff going on. So meanwhile, everyone's been talking about us all week. There's been like so many things that could have been fixed with like direct communication, like early on, like put your stuff in your suitcase every day was an expectation that I didn't know was happening that I would never do on my own, but would have adjusted easily. But so it all, it's all festering right all week, including like my sister seeing that like an opportunity has opened to like really hurt me. So on like the eighth day, we do this big family shoot, family photo shoot, which in Colombia is like, forever it lasts forever first all the women then all the men then just the kids then this family then this family then everybody then now with the grandparents it's just like it's crazy and it goes on forever so that ends and my sister calls me and my cousin and my little my youngest brother over and starts just screaming at us it was the craziest thing I've ever experienced uh about something that I'm not going to even indulge the content because honestly it didn't matter she was upset about something that we did that had zero negative consequences. It was just, it was just the little snack that she needed to have her opportunity to flip out. This is also not, not out of the norm for her. And it's also not out of the norm culturally, like of bringing back in the cultural piece. Like you don't deal with your feelings. You don't deal with your feelings. You don't deal with your feelings. You explode and then everything's, and then you just move forward. And then everyone just goes, Oh, that was annoying. And just like carries on, right? It's just, it's so foreign to me. So first thing I do is like physically back up. (laughs) And then I'm texting one of my closest adoptee friends. And she's like with me in the moment. And I'm like, my sister's screaming, like, this is crazy. And she's like, just take some space. You know, she's going to me through it. Thank you, Summer. (laughs) I love you. And so I'm like sitting down now, but it's still going on. And it goes on forever. And it goes into this whole attack that like is specifically would be designed to make an adoptee like go insane like how she nobody wants me in this family and if I'm not going to be like the family then I should get out and just craziness right and she's also screaming at me in Spanish so I'm not even getting everything I'm getting enough all the kids are here like this is like a show right like it's and she wants me to respond and I'm not going to take the bait. Right. And I'm also like choking back tears. I'm like, she will not see mm. me cry. Right. Like I'm like locked down, but I also froze, which is pretty rare. Right. But we know trauma responses, fight, flight or freeze. And that's not my usual go-to, but I was so overwhelmed that I froze and I have a lot of regret about that. But I also have compassion that that's just what my amygdala decided I was going to do in that moment. So this like goes on forever. My mom gets involved. It's like, she like whipped everyone up. Right. It was just like this weird, crazy frenzy. So eventually it ended things transpired over the night. It was just a really rough night. Of course I broke down. I was crying all night. I'm like talking to my friend and my partner's there. My partner was sleeping through this. He was upstairs. So then he wakes up to me sobbing and shaking in bed and poor thing uh and has to deal with me and so you know we like don't feel welcome we wanted to leave but it's the middle of the night so we wait till morning we go get breakfast we go find a hotel to go to we just had one more night there it didn't make sense to move our flights or anything so we just went to a hotel in town um which my brother helped us find and so meanwhile my mom has been my sister has still been stirring up my mom which it's a important moment to pause and say that my mom was 16 when she had my sister. My sister's older than me. They have an interesting kind of inverted relationship, which can often happen, right? When teenagers have babies that there's like a parentified child role kind of with the child. So my sister's kind of the matriarch of my family. She has a lot of, she takes care of everyone, like financially, most of my family in the beginning of the year lived in her house, which changed by the end of the year, which is interesting. But, you know, she's she's kind of the leader of the family. So she has this influence over my mom that's like kind of maternal. 
and, and interesting. So in, in certain cases, I think when my mom is a certain level of vulnerable, she can get under her skin and like kind of whip her up a little bit. So she's whipped my mom up that like, I've done something terrible and that I'm also like acting terrible in response to it. So she's email, she's texting me, texting me, texting me. And I'm saying, I don't want to talk. I'm too overwhelmed. I'm like really, 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 really upset. I, can you please just let me calm down? She shows up when we're taking our bags to go to the hotel, asked to talk to me. I said, fine, you have five minutes. She just starts screaming which again has never happened before. I've never seen this side of her and she's just screaming at me and I'm like, nope, not today, right? Like I'm a little bit more with my faculties and I'm like, not today. So, you know, I scream at my partner and I'm like, let's go. We've got our bags and and we leave and she's yelling at me the whole time. So that was me really breaking a cultural norm. Like you stay and you take your verbal whipping. That's like what you do as a child. Do you like take your punishment is sort of how it's viewed. Like you be a good kid and take your punishment and sit here and like deal with the shaming and the yelling. And so by leaving, which I was doing to take care of myself, right? There's my healthy boundary, right? There's my self-regulation. It's seen as very rebellious. So she is now, if she was at an 11, she's now at a 19 and she is rapid texting me just venom. I never saw this side of her before the cruelest things anyone's ever said to me in my entire life. She used so many things against me, attacked just everything about me. Um, I'm not going to even say the exact things because I just, I, I still now, even in the aftermath, I do feel protective of this side of her that was just, it's a really cruel part of her. Uh, but I know it's a reaction to trauma, right? But she just went at me in a way that I couldn't deal with. I was laying on the ground in our hotel room, tremoring, sobbing, uh, just like trying to calm down my baby part. That was my only goal. I just kept saying like, you're okay, we're okay, you're okay, we're okay. Just like so dysregulated. And I just couldn't believe it. And and in those moments, I was also, I was really trying to just stay with what was happening for me and, and calm myself down. But of course there's other parts of me that are thinking and, you know, I'm really feeling like I lost her. I, I don't have my mom anymore. It really felt like I, I don't know how I could ever trust her again, that she would say these things to me. Like, who even are you? Right. It felt like, okay, if this is really you, then like everything else was a lie. And then like, and I can't, you know, okay. And you know, I have like my pull yourself up by your bootstraps parts that are like, we lived without a mom for 30 and a half years. We can do it again. Like we'll survive. We're not going to give right. Like I'm already like rallying the troops, right? Like I'm like, I will get through this, which I know I could have, but it, I think that just goes to speak to how, when we're rewounded or re-traumatized, how, strong that impulse is to just shut the door. So your mom is texting you these Uh horrible things. Okay. Eventually she stopped. I'd never wrote back that day. I never responded at all. I just felt like she was out of her mind, which she was, she was completely out of her mind. So you're getting texts from your sister and from your mom? No, my sister had given up at that point. The damage had been done that she wanted to inflict to me, which was to humiliate me in front of my whole family. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm like dying, you know, it's, it's really rough. And then we have this huge long journey back to Kali. We get back, um, at this point I'm already like having my usual things that I have when I have an extreme trauma response, which is like my digestive system is insane, like wreaking havoc on my body. Soon after that, I got really sick again, which was my fourth time in the hospital in Colombia. This time it was different than the other times though. And then ultimately we decided it was probably dengue fever, which is from the mosquitoes in Janos, which if you grow up there, there's two strains of dengue fever. You get them each as a child and then you never get them again. But the emotional crisis, I think perfectly set my body up to come down with something like this. So it's like a days long fever with a rash all over your body and vomiting and just all of it. It's super fun. (laughs) So sounds like it. I'm like dealing with that, dealing with that as I'm like 
dealing with all this emotional stuff and, and not talking to my mom, really not being ready and really wondering like, is this it? Is this over? And we still had three months left. Like, what am I even doing here anymore? You know, it just, it was really, really crushing. The interesting piece of aftermath was also that my little brother, my youngest brother, as a result of all of this, decided he didn't want to live with my sister anymore. So he had asked if he could stay with us for a couple weeks while he looked for a place when we got back from that trip. And so, of course, we said yes. And so two weeks was actually three and a half months. He moved out a week before we left in July. <laughs> um, but that was a whole other element. Is this so this this must feel like this must feel like choosing sides then. Yes. Like he's choosing your side. Yes. Yeah. So I was worried about <sighs> that. And ha- so just the whole system reconfigures. Right. And so and I have my my great uncle, who's my abuelo's brother, was one of the few people that I reached out to. He's this like really grounded voice of wisdom in my family. I know that my mom will listen to him. And we talked and, and even he though, he's not wrong. I love him so much, but he, I wasn't ready for any of it either, but he, his view was, you know, better, Marta, you know, more about all of this. You understand trauma better. You have to be the one to forgive. You have to be the one to open your hand up. And I, I just wasn't ready at that point. So I did, I took, I took care of myself the way that I know how to in the face of no one really understanding that. I did it anyways. I took a lot of space. I told her I needed time that I did not know when I was going to be able to talk, that I felt really unsafe around her. You know, I did articulate a lot about how violated I felt and how dysregulated my, you know, I talked to her about parts anyways, even though she doesn't (laughs) understand IFS, I told her my traumatized baby is like feeling really unsafe. I can't be around you right now. I don't know when I'll be ready. (sighs) Talking to my supports at this point was huge, of course. And, but ultimately it was about me having IFS in my life, about me having this language, because what I had to sit with, what I'm still sitting with is that part of my mom hates me. Part of my mom maybe even wishes that I didn't exist. I'm a physical reminder of her rape. And even though I look way more like my mom than, I mean, I haven't even seen a photo, but I look, people call us twins. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of pictures of her when she was younger, but the people that knew her when she was younger say that we're, we're identical. So I don't have that piece that some children who are products of rape have of looking like that person, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm, I'm the physical evidence of what happened to her. And, and some of the cruelest things she said to me that day were specifically about how I came into this world and this piece that I've been secretly feeling so vulnerable about, right, that we had never processed to weaponize it against me in a moment of vulnerability. I just, it feels so heartless. But then if I back up and put my clinical hat on, I know she was really triggered being there, right? All of those stressors that I said before, being in that environment. I know she felt really exposed to, and it was just a perfect storm of triggers. And she lashed out because there's so much pain inside of her that she hasn't healed, that she hasn't let out. And she unleashed it on me. And while I don't think that that's okay, obviously I do understand why it happened. And there came a point you know, I just missed her, even though she hurt me so much worse than anyone's ever hurt me. I just, a day after day, I was starting to miss her and I was starting to wonder, you know, is this really how I want to leave here? Am I not gonna, am I really not going to make this repair? Am I really going to give up on this? Am I really ready? You know, I do have those parts. I know I could survive it, but the same way that my lens on her parts and her trauma helps me with compassion. I also still strongly feel like my responsibility is to my parts. And my job is to take care of my traumatized little girl. And the question is like, do you know, many, I say one, like my baby, but really like, I feel very fun toward my five-year-old and my adolescent part too. So all these little girls, right. That I'm responsible for 
what's going to serve their healing. Is it to lose her again? Or is it my job to make sure that they have their mom so that they can heal and they can feel safe? So we met with my translator, my friend that's a translator and called and after some, a lot of texting and we met in person and we just, we talked a lot about some of the things that there was a lot said in the aftermath that I was really upset about too. And, uh, so just healing up some of those wounds and, and really, I think ultimately what it was, was I saw her fear too. And I don't know if she could have survived losing me again. I don't know if I could have survived losing her again. At some point, somehow that all became clear to me that, that it wasn't necessarily about what happened that day, but it was about moving forward together because to lose each other again, I think would have just been so detrimental to both of us. And actually my mom has a lot of heart problems. And unsurprisingly, she had a lot of symptoms after this trip. Like her heart was literally breaking. So I, I'm really protective, obviously, of her health. And um, ultimately, we moved through it. And, and by, the time, by the time I left, a couple months later, we were pretty much back where we had started. And, and now we're, I mean, we talk every day. Um, she texted me good luck before I signed on with you. And um, mm. yeah, I just, I'm, I can't imagine my life without her. And I know that so many reunions break because there's unhealed trauma and, and things that happen that just feel too painful to survive. And, and we feel like we have to walk away. And I'm absolutely not saying like, whatever, just deal with whatever <laughs> happens to you in these relationships take care of yourself. Like, again, I'm telling this story in like 10 minutes, but like it really evolved over like two entire months. And, and there's a lot that I'm not speaking to, of course, and Mm. it was complicated, but I, I still, at the end of the day, I'm so grateful. And I, and without IFS, I don't know how I could hold that truth that this woman that loves me, like would move heaven and earth for me is so loving also has a part of her that hates me, but that's just true. (laughs) That's just, being a human that's experienced trauma, it's not black and white. It's not like she loves me or she doesn't. I know that she loves me. And there's a part of her that, that hates me because I'm the reminder. I'm the proof. And I have to do my own work around that, around accepting that. Mm. Can you say how long like thinking about things and processing before you guys all met with the translator? Like how much space did you give yourself? I think probably six weeks at least, maybe more. I can't remember exactly, but... That's the thing. I don't want to gloss over that because it wasn't like, oh, and then the next day, okay, we met up. This is like a big process. Yes. And, you know, I don't... I worked part-time when I was down there, but I really didn't have a lot going on, I said, I mean, everything shifted. If I gave you like what a week looked like before that trip and a week after, like I also was grieving the loss of my brother that I talked about in the last episode. So suddenly I wasn't hanging out with him most of the time. Suddenly my youngest, my baby brother is living with us and I'm all messed up. Right. And I don't really want him to see me like that. So I'm like, hiding in my room, but then he's like, where are you? He's worried. He's so worried about me. I mean, he's never seen anyone. (laughs) It's funny when I step back, he's never seen someone feel something and move through it. Like in the moment, like the way that I sob when I'm moving through something, I think like really jostles him. Like, are you going to die? And I'm like, no, I'm just feeling my feelings. Like this is (laughs) so normal. And Tyson, my my partner Tyson's just like sitting there, right. While I'm like, (laughs) because he's just used to me (laughs) and my brother's (laughs) like, oh my God, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just, you know, feeling all my feels. So I didn't have a lot going on. I, you know, I just, this was what I was dealing with. This was what I was talking about. This was what I was writing about. This was what I was feeling, you know, and in it, in and out of it, like we are in our process. I was also, you know, doing numbing stuff and staring at Netflix and, you know, you can't be with it all the time, every second, but yeah, it, it was a, it was a while. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's, I think it's really helpful for us to see like really a a point where reunion could have just broken down Mm -hmm. for good. And then what you did to what you chose to do um, instead of walking away. I think so many of us, it's, it's easier to just be like, Hey, that's it. And just shut that box. And um, cause it's so painful to look at and yeah, thank you for your wisdom in there. Um, Is there anything else you want to say to us about that processing anything else in this area before we wrap up? I think just that, you know, and of course I can't speak for everybody. I only know my mom, but I would say like, trust the things that you do know, if you have done some of your work, like I know that people can't hear things in an activated state, right? So it was it was weeks later before I even started having more conversations about it with her. And and ultimately she did open up to my point of view. She did want to hear things and even if her beliefs don't change, like she she is list, she was willing to listen, right? We still had difficult important conversations. And so I think, you know, and that's, again, that's with that language barrier I was talking about. That's with the cultural barrier and the mental health barrier. And so it's complicated and and you, you have to be kind of tenacious about it. I think that to know that like, we may have to have the same conversation five times in five different ways, because there's so much that's could be possibly getting lost in translation here. And I think know, when we're raw, that's so hard, right? Like she sends me something and I don't know, I don't know those words. And I put it through Google translate and it hits me in the gut, right? I have to be willing to take a breath in that moment and say like, can you say that another way? Is that really what you meant? You know, instead of flipping out, which is so hard to do. I'm not, all of this is so effing hard. (laughs) It's so hard, but but I think it's it's ultimately worth it. Hmm. Well, I think one of the the most insightful things that you shared with us today was just that line that, you know, we kind of glossed over it, but you said, I was in my story and she was in her story. And just how powerful that is to think about that. I mean, we're lo- sort of looking at everybody else thinking, oh, well, they know what's going on for me, but they don't. Like people are just like, in their own story. I I think that's so valuable to kind of just pin that away in the back of your head so that you can come back and be like, oh, they're in their story. I'm in my story. Yes. Uh, Wow. Thank you so much, Marta. I I mean, truly for inviting us into some very um, intimate and vulnerable moments in your story and you know, going to back to painful th- things, you know, I, that comes at a cost. And so I'm very grateful that you're willing to share that with us. And I know it's going to be so helpful to, um, so many of us. Um, so thank you. And where can we connect with you online? My website for my practice is www.martadrakenberglmhc.com. And you can find an email for me on there. I did also want to say, since we were talking about IFS at the beginning, I did, wasn't thinking of doing any recommended resources, but I will put in a tiny plug for Jonathan Van Ness's book, Over the Top, A Raw Journey to Self-Love. His memoir came out for anyone who watches Queer Eye. He is the hairstylist on Queer Eye. He has survived a tremendous amount of trauma. He has been in IFS therapy for years. And his oh. memoir is hugely integrates IFS. And it's it's awesome. Uh, I listened to it on audiobook. Wow, that is so interesting. I had no idea. I think he has a podcast too. He has a podcast called Getting Curious. There's also an episode with Rick, uh, Richard Schwartz, the creator of IFS. That's so amazing. Okay. <laughs> so fun to watch Dick interact with Jonathan's parts. Okay. Thank you for those recommendations. That is excellent. And I think I love hearing you talk about IFS because it's so unique. I mean, in my perspective, it's so unique. Uh, and I, I don't know. I haven't told you this, I don't think, but I've heard from several listeners 
that they have started IFS since hearing your episodes. Oh, that's so great. And not just that, I know of one who is a mental health professional and she started training in IFS because she um, found it so interesting and helpful. So you're making, look at that, Marta, the adoptees on IFS influencer. Oh my God, <laughs> I love it. I also have started working in adoption for the first time since the last time I saw you. So since I've been back in Boston, I've been working at Boston Post Adoption Resources, which is in Brookline, and we're doing really awesome work. So if you're in the area or in Massachusetts and you need resources, call us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Don't you just feel so thankful when someone opens up and shares like that on the show. I truly am so grateful and I wouldn't be able to do the show without people being vulnerable and, you know, teaching through their experiences and, and also therapists who have, you know, this wealth of knowledge and then actually applying it in real life. Um, This is a pretty valuable show. I'm just, I'm really grateful. Thank you so much again, Marta, for sharing with us. I truly, um, you know, it's hard to know the impact of the podcast sometimes because I only hear from a very small percentage of listeners, but I know there's, you know, thousands of you listening, but it's one of episodes like this and last week's that you just know this will have an impact on someone else's reunion and helping them navigate so such an impact. And if you want the show to continue and keep having an impact like this and and hopefully helping save some reunions through, you know, understanding, you know, Marta's experience and how you can you can learn from it and you can kind of, you know, look at oh, what went wrong with mine and how can we heal it and, you know, work together to um, a new understanding of each other. I mean, if you want that kind of value in the world, please consider partnering with my podcast and go to adoptizon.com slash partner to support the show. It is so meaningful to me when you sign up, um, you know, you're saying like, I want this show to exist in the world. I want other adoptees to have access to this information. Um, other family members of fa- members of the constellation to be able to hear about the adoptee experience and hopefully get us on the same page. I just, I can't do the show without your help. So if you have had that experience and have learned something from the podcast, please go to adoptizon.com slash partner and check out all the ways you can support the show. And right now, as I've been telling you for the last few weeks, we are doing an adoptees only reading challenge. It's been so, so fun. And you can access that when you go to adoptizon.com slash partner. Okay. Thanks so much for listening. Let's talk again next Friday. 